comments. Uh, so I want to introduce Dr. Libby Stout, who we have with us today. It's such an honor. Libby is an addiction psychiatrist. Uh, Libby served as the medical director at the Circle Program, which was an incredibly important program in Colorado, serving people with dual diagnosis and really on the more extreme end of the spectrum with substance abuse and mental health issues. And uh, Libby is also an AccuDetox trainer and has led the National Association for um, Acupuncture Detoxification. And so, so happy to have you here tonight with us, Libby. I also want to introduce Holly Malone, who is a, a peer mentor for Natural Highs and is also a certified AccuDetox provider and has a very powerful story with um, substances and psychiatric medications and recovery and uh, is a very, very important young person on our team in Natural Highs. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm also here for any questions. Uh, my name is Avani Dilger. I work as a trauma therapist and substance abuse counselor and have for the last 20 years in the Boulder community. And I started Natural Highs as a nonprofit to really make cutting edge neuroscience and uh, cutting edge approaches available to people who otherwise would not have access. Um, and then we have Angie Peacock, who you see is the rock star in the film and is such an important uh, bridge builder and advocate for changes in the mental health field. And so, and all of you, and if we wouldn't be such a large group, we would want to go around and hear from everybody who you are, what your piece of the puzzle is. So we are so happy to see you uh, because we want to ignore that we're online. We just want to imagine that we're all together as humans with human connection. And so um, we welcome any of your questions. John, you want to say a few words before we get started? He's still on mute, though. Uh, I, uh, I've unmuted. Uh, no, I, I, I was just so humbled by this film. I, 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 I'm in awe of what you've done. And um, I had suffered a major uh, depressive break a year and a half ago. And I was on SSRIs for four months and I realized they were affecting me and, and I tapered off and I was one of the lucky ones. I didn't suffer any of the, the, the side effects, but watching this and watching the manipulation with the drug companies, thank you, all of you for what you're doing. Thank you for letting us have this conversation, John. It's, it takes a brave community to to, you know, this is such a taboo topic. I don't mean to speak so much, but hold on, let me just say a little intro. You know, it's a taboo topic. You know, we don't want to, we, we don't want to shame anyone or, you know, judge them for their choices. That's not where we're coming from. But this conversation about psychiatric drugs being like a first line of treatment, it's not being had really anywhere. And I know even being trained as a therapist, I, that's not in the film, but I was trained as an outpatient therapist. Um, I decided not to get licensed for many different reasons. But even in my training, I just graduated a year ago from the top, top program in the country. And not one thing was mentioned about informed consent, about psychiatric drugs, about what happens when you're in practice with the client and you can't really tell, is this the medication affecting them? Is this just their symptoms? We can't tell the difference. Like none of this was even mentioned in my training. And I kept thinking 273 social workers in the top program in the country, and they're not learning anything about this. It's so frustrating. And we wonder like, the, the question that the, the movie came from and also a book that should be mandatory reading it's called anatomy of an epidemic by robert whitaker he's the one in the in the program in the film that was talking about the xanax studies he um he said that the way he came upon this was if our mental health system is working so great why are our disability rates and suicide rates so high so that's a question that we all should be asking like if we're throwing money at mental health and we're having all these anti-stigma campaigns, why aren't we all getting better? So anyway, I'm just so glad to be here. I'm so glad to see your faces. We don't ever get to see faces. So thank you for being brave. And if you put your hand down, it will signal me to turn your camera on, but you can change your name. You can leave your camera off. You can just, we can just hear your voice. It's up to you. The book is Anatomy of an Epidemic by Robert Whitaker. Okay, go ahead, Avani, it's all yours. 
Perfect. So I'm just putting in links into the chat because we got a few questions where people are very interested in having more material and getting more information and background. So go on medicatingnormal.com. I know that Angie and her team, they put amazing resources together. And then you are also welcome to check out our website, naturalhighs.org, that we also uh, we're providing lots of resources right now for mental health and substance abuse during COVID in particular. So welcome to check that out. Okay, so where should we start? Do you want to let, how about let Libby and Holly introduce themselves? And then if you all in the audience have any questions, start putting them in the Q&A box, not the chat box, but the Q&A, and then I'll start feeding questions to them. Or you can come on camera and start talking as soon as Holly and Libby are done. <laughs> Okay, I'll start. Uh, I'm Libby Stout, and I am an addiction psychiatrist. I've been working in this field for the last 30 years, and for the last 20 years, uh, was able to run this really phenomenal program that Abani mentioned called the Circle Program, and it really doesn't exist anywhere else in the country uh, because it's a 90-day inpatient treatment program funded by the state of Colorado, uh, and I had the great benefit of treating people in an inpatient setting because um, getting off these drugs is really difficult. It's a lot easier when you're in a controlled environment and you can use a lot of support. Uh, and so my mission, I mean, I've always thought like Robert Whitaker and I was so glad when I met him and I read his book and I try and get all psychiatrists to read his book, but it's kind of a hard sell that I really um, think, I think there's a place for medication, some, but it's very short term. And, and my most hated drug are benzos. I mean, I, I don't prescribe them, except when I'm treating alcohol withdrawal. That's a very appropriate place to use them. Uh, and it's very short term, but they really shouldn't be used longer than a month. And I have been successful in getting people off even fairly rapidly, but in a controlled environment. So um, I have attempted to do things outpatient, working through a, a healthcare facility, but that's a whole lot harder. And uh, that's one of the reasons why I do the ear acupuncture. I have found that to be really helpful, getting people off of psych meds. Um, and it just, it's just something that helps calm, it, it takes care of a lot of the symptoms. And, the, the, you know, this, what's interesting, what we're experiencing in Colorado, I don't know about all your other places, but this advent of medical marijuana and the serious problems that we're seeing with that. And it's interesting that we're having the exact same problems, but people don't look at it that way. I mean, people are using really high potency products for medical reasons, and they're starting to have all kinds of problems. And then getting off of it is really, really difficult. And so if you have the combination of drug use, alcohol use, and psychiatric meds, it makes it even worse. But I think this, this film is so well done. I mean, it's the second time I've watched it, and I had to watch it the whole time. It's hard to not watch it. And I think it's really excellent, and it gives a really excellent message. Thank you for touching on that because, um, yeah, my, my name is Holly and my experience with, um, with psychiatric meds also included my um, process with addiction. I was diagnosed with, or I wasn't even diagnosed with ADHD before I was actually started um, being prescribed Adderall. Um, I was prescribed Adderall for two whole years. Can you guys hear me all right? Perfect. Yep. Um, I was prescribed Adderall for two years um, before actually being, yeah, it's interesting because I definitely, I was asking my doctor for it and I was saying, hey, I'm really struggling in school. Um, please help me. I need, I think I need Adderall because I was taking it from my friends because um, I, I was really, I had a hard time focusing and 
my Adderall dose, I just kept asking for more and more, which I realized is partially because, um, you know, I have addictive behaviors. And so I think a big part of that was, was liking how it was making me feel, liking how it was having me perform in school. Um, but the higher my dose went up, the more anxiety I felt and the more stress and the less I was sleeping and the less I was eating, because those are all very common side effects of taking Adderall, especially when you're taking 30, 40 milligrams in a day. Um, so I'm, I'm glad that you bring that up, Libby, because then I started self-medicating because I felt so dependent on my Adderall to be able to perform in school that I, I would. I was like, I can't stop taking this much. I have to keep going. I have to keep getting these grades. I'm normal. My, my peers are starting to like me because I'm not having outbursts. Um, but then at night, I was so dependent on having to eat or sleep that I was smoking all the time. Um, and that was just a perfect, perfect recipe for addiction to breed. Um, so that went on for about yeah, like four years of my life and it got worse and worse. I tried to cope with alcohol. The Adderall was never enough. Um, eventually I stopped having the results in school that I was having it when it first started. So I was trying to take more and more. And um, eventually I just stopped even doing school at all because my addiction had gotten so intense that I, all I could do was smoke. Um, you know, and I, I think that there are two things going on here, right? So there's a psychiatric meds that are influencing that, but then there's also the addiction coming through. But yeah, it was just, it was an extremely painful process. And um, about a year, a little under a year and a half, or it's been a year and seven months ago, I stopped taking Adderall. Um, and I, I went cold turkey. So I stopped taking it all, all the other drugs. I, I decided to go sober. Um, and, but I kept holding on to Adderall because I had such a heavy dependency on it. And I thought, well, I can't get rid of that. I need that for school. I need that for driving. I can't drive a car without it. Um, but eventually I realized that that was the biggest addiction out of everything. So I, I actually went cold Turkey, which I'm, I realized now was not a good decision for me to make. Yeah. Um, and I, I've been experiencing being dopamine deficient for probably the last year and seven months. Um, and it's been very, very difficult. I was, I'm very fortunate to have been able to take time off of school so that I could let my brain heal, but I was severely, severely depressed mixing that with, you know, um, loss of identity with trying to get sober. What does that mean? Who am I? What's my identity? And then on top of that, having absolutely zero motivation to be anything, to do anything. I think the only thing I was doing at the time was showing up for natural highs, um, which is the program that Avani teaches. And I, I would get up out of bed, go to my program, get my, get my group therapy, and then go back and sleep. Um, and it was really painful for me as well, because I was using Adderall as something to also accomplish my eating disorder. So the process of gaining weight and having all of that is just extremely low self-esteem. So there's no, there's no hope with anything. You don't have any motivation to do anything. You have zero self-esteem to be, yeah, to pretty much show your face. Um, and so then it's a vicious cycle of shame. And I'm extremely grateful that I had the support that I did to come out of that but I still am coming out of that a year and seven months later. And again, I want to acknowledge my privilege because I, I was blessed to be able to take time off school, to have parents that could support me getting therapy and help. And um, yeah, and it's, it's, it's crazy. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for letting me share that. Oh, Thank Angie, you. you're muted. Yeah, sorry. Okay, Jason, I'd like for you to go first. You got your hand raised. Hi, I'm Jason. Thank you, Angie. I appreciate it. I've been um, talking with Nicole Lamperson from Dunza Information Coalition and her cold turkey experience and her attractive withdrawal, and she inspired me, um, but also made me even more angry at Hazelton in Center City, Lindstrom, Minnesota, where I went um, to get off of Klonopin. I had no idea you know, that's when the benzo crisis came out on CNN with Lisa Ling. And, you know, I just hard to even talk about it. It was so traumatic. And just, I ended up in the ER after 60 days. And, you know, the damage from benzos uh, and um, antidepressants is, is a thing. But I think the damage from stopping them immediately on a high dose is a whole nother 
type of damage besides the damage that the drugs do in and of themselves. And that's the conversation Nicole Lamberson and I have been having um, because I think it's important to, de to sometimes delineate these things. I think we all have different facets of uh, psychotropic medication that we need to speak about and they're personal to ourselves. But for me, you know, I think the damage is there, whether I taper or whatever, and I'm, I'm not going to go into that right now, but I think it's very important to uh, acknowledge people who have been forced cold turkey and gone through terrible um, things and, and what that, that derives, I'm guessing PTSD on top of all the other neurological symptoms. So it's, it's just something I wanted to, to speak on and I'm grateful to be able to be on a big panel like this and be able to bring it up um, and put some candlelight <laughs> to it. Um, but yeah, I'd like to hear what other people have to say. And I just wanted to bring that up because I think it's extremely important. Uh, just so to give a little background, a little background is that um, Nicole is our, one of my outreach partners. So she helps plan screening. Yeah. And she's a physician's assistant, so she's very involved with the film. Um, and the organization he was speaking of is Benzodiazepine Information Coalition. So it's an organization that's trying to bring awareness. And so right here, I think I'd like to explain the difference between addiction and de phys physiological dependence, because they can get really conflated. And I don't say this to like shame addicts or something like I'm just telling the difference because the treatment is different and what it looks like in clinical practice for those public health people in the audience looks different. So there's people like me and probably Jason too, that we just took Prozac, we took, you know, Ativan, whatever, Adderall, whatever drug it was as prescribed, the doctor gave it to us. It, it might've been a low dose. It might've been for two or three years, whatever. Then addiction would be like, you know, you're craving it, you're feeling euphoria, you're maybe running out early. There can be pseudo addiction in there. I won't get into that. But what I'm saying, the movie is mostly focused on those people that just are following doctor's orders, taking it exactly as prescribed or less than prescribed, not in high doses. And people come off for varying reasons, like women when they get pregnant or women, you know, um, teenagers when they age out of a system and they don't have insurance anymore. Uh, uh, cr like, Prisoners, when they get out of prison, they don't have insurance. They can't take medication anymore. So there's this whole sector of community at all these different ages that need to come off medications for one reason or another. And because the medical industry hasn't really filled in that gap of evidence about how to get off safely, this is going to shock everybody. Hold your horses. But there is a whole patient-led lay person withdrawal community it's like an underground of people that are online helping each other figure out how to get off their drugs which is shocking to me it was shocking when i saw it i never knew that existed until i was six days off and i just happened to google benzo withdrawal and there it was i had no idea this was even a thing so it's really scary to think you know these patients are doing this at home but like as you saw in the film shalimar is cutting her pills I counted beads with and licked my finger for two and a half years to get off Cymbalta. There is patients doing this all over the world. So what Jason is kind of highlighting, I hear it all every day, all day in these groups, these patients go to their doctor, maybe their doctor retires, maybe they move, they can't find a doctor to prescribe anymore. They are cold turkeyed overnight. They show up in the emergency room. The doctor doesn't know what to do. They might send them home with a week of Valium to get over it. And they're, they're on their own literally on their own. And these are not just like one-off cases. We see this every day in the groups everywhere. And it's just, I don't know. So that's my part in it. Well, Libby, what do you think about all that? Um, I, I agree completely. And yeah, there is, a, <laughs> there is a big difference between people addicted to it and then people just habituated to it that are taking it normally. Um, <clears throat> it actually is easier to work with the people that are addicted to it because you have to stop it. And so <clears throat> you have to do it quickly. You can't do this long outpatient taper because then they end up abusing it and um, you just can't. But with people that are taking it responsibly, I mean, there's no, you're not gonna put them inpatient because no insurance is gonna pay for it. Although that would be ideal. That would be the best way to do it. It's not gonna happen. And so it has to be done really, really slowly over a long period of time. 
And many, many people, well, most doctors don't know how to do that. And what I'm finding hearing from other people is that you gotta have money to find a doctor who can do that. It's not like if you're in Medicaid, you can get a Medicaid doctor that, that can help you. And that's really, really sad. And so and that's why most of my effort is trying to educate prescribers to not prescribe, like don't get into this cycle um, and educate people. So this whole thing about informed consent is so important. People have to know this about all psychiatric drugs. Um, it just, problem is it doesn't happen. Yeah, and can I add something? Uh, you know, we have, we're now going through the Boulder tragedy where people are, you know, in severe grief and people feel traumatized and people feel symptoms like depression, anxiety, and PTSD. And we're, for example, we're offering AccuDetox right now, which is this uh, ear acupuncture that really helps people work with these symptoms in a way that doesn't have side effects, right? And so I'm just aware that, you know, we have this opportunity in our community available, but not all communities have that available. Like either, you know, to even have alternatives uh, to work with symptoms that are actually not mental health disorders, that are actually healthy reactions to trauma or to tragedies, you know, that should not be pathologized or medicated. Uh, and so we just want that these resources are available to people, you know, that, that there's choices that people know, oh, if I now have anxiety or grief, uh, I don't need to go to a doctor to get a benzodiazepine. There's other options of how I can be okay. Um, so I just wanted to mention that because we have that right now in front of us with Boulder. And uh, so for anybody who's close, we're holding free AccuDetox every Tuesday now for the Boulder community and anybody can come because we want to show people that it's okay to feel sad and it's okay to have reactions, emotional reactions. They don't mean that something is wrong with you, you know? So let's, let's go to a question. We have a bunch of great questions here. Um, this is a good one. Would you all recommend that most people try to taper off of their medication, antidepressants, anti-anxiety, et cetera? What do you think? Good question. Go ahead, Libby. That yeah. is a good question. Yeah. <laughs> um, most of my career has been spent trying to get people off of medications um, because I truly do think they are only beneficial short term. And, I, and that's why I really like Robert Whitaker's book and all the research he's doing, because it, it is true that most of the studies are only done over a four week period, maybe eight weeks. And the difference between the drug and placebo is often almost none, like not much different. So there is some benefit when you use it initially, but then your, your brain adjusts to it. And so your chemistry in your brain adjusts to the, the chemical. And then when you take it away, your brain is having problems adjusting again. And, and so that's why I think, you know, if somebody is acutely depressed, you know, and, and they get on an antidepressant and they feel better, then I think that it's appropriate to use that for a short period of time, maybe one to two months. And then I think people should start tapering off to see, because what happens is, and this is, this is true for addictive drugs too, what happens is people, their brain becomes adjusted to it. And so when they take it away, the symptoms return, but it's really withdrawal. And they think, oh, I really needed this. So that pro that's proof that I needed it. So I gotta keep taking it. Where it's really, your brain is adjusting and it's withdrawal. And so if you're feeling much better, that's a good thing, then it should be appropriate to consider coming off of it to see how you do. Because the longer you're on it, the harder it is to get off. And that's, that's true for all of these drugs. Um, and I've seen some of the worst is SSRIs, where people 
just, you know, even though that's not, quote, an addictive medication, it does change your brain chemistry. And so when people come off, they have all kinds of very weird symptoms. And then they think, oh, it must have been working. And so they keep taking it. Um, and it may not have been working at all. And as Ivani and I see often, what most people's experience is from is from some kind of traumatic experience. It could be complex trauma from childhood. It could be some major trauma as an adult. And it's adjusting to that. Like Angie, you experienced huge trauma. Um, and the body has trouble adjusting to that, but it's totally possible to learn how to deal with it. We, we're in this reductive society where we believe we have to take a pill to fix something. And it's a simple fix. And there is no such thing as a simple fix. So I think, you know, we, we understand now so much more neuroscience about what happens to people uh, with trauma. And we now have treatments. And unfortunately, that is not always known in the main, mainstream mental health system uh, to tell the difference between trauma symptoms and a mental health disorder. Uh, so I just want to give you an example. I work with brain spotting, which is a really cutting edge new development out of EMDR. Uh, which was developed really to address PTSD in combat veterans. And so, you know, it's, it's so important that people who have symptoms from trauma that can look like a mental health um, issue, um, you know, I call it a healthy reaction because if somebody has anxiety after trauma, to me, that is not a disorder. To me, that is a healthy reaction, but that somebody might need help for. But that help exists. But unfortunately, you have to be very specific that you have to find somebody who can actually resolve the underlying trauma that is um, causing these mental health symptoms. Because really, a symptom is your engine light in the car that is blinking that is telling you that something is not processed or that something is not okay. And, you know, it's not going to help to just take out the engine light. Uh, you're going to have to look under the hood, like what is actually going on? Because we know that, you know, if only the symptoms get addressed, people get worse because the, the real issue is not getting treated. So we just want to spread the information that there are now cutting edge treatments there are now EMDR therapists and brain spotting therapists in our community. People can even find people who work through Medicaid. So, I mean, this is news. This is information we all just need to pass on so that, you know, people know that there is now alternative treatments available. We have so many good questions. I know I'm not going to get to all of them. I'm so sorry, but I, I do definitely want to, I want to shift to Holly and talk about the teen perspective, especially when it comes to ADHD. So there's a couple questions um, and comments, you know, about the overdiagnosis of ADHD, kids not, you know, it, the minute you're not able to sit in your chair for five hours, you're a problem. Can we talk about this teen issue and maybe the overdiagnosis part and and I really like the, the way you were saying kind of it led to your substance abuse like do you see that in your peers so let's hear from you Polly yeah um so the first thing that I want to talk about is there is an extreme overdiagnose or diagnosis of people with ADHD but at the same time I also think that it, it might be accurate. Like we might just have a hard time sitting and focusing. And if that fits the criteria for what ADHD or ADD is, then everyone has it. But the thing that's really difficult for me, and I would assume for other people that are in my shoes, is that while everyone is being diagnosed with this now, they're not actually changing the curriculum in school to cater to our brains. You know, so I, something that I've had to come to terms with is that there actually isn't anything wrong with my brain and that I'm unique and capable and I'm not lazy and I, I can focus. It just has to take maybe different circumstances. Um, and if, if other people are in the same boat as me, the school system isn't changing. And so that's what's really infuriating about this because while they're pushing that diagnosis and putting everyone and their brother on Adderall, 
then or Vyvanse or whatever and pumping everyone full of drugs, but and then they're not actually changing the curriculum. So then we're stuck kind of just running around in circles and it doesn't actually help. Um, so I definitely do think that they are over diagnosing people to have to to gain profit. Um, because if they actually cared about the education and the well-being and the the betterment of the people they're diagnosing, then they would look at the bigger problem and say, hmm, how can we support these people beyond just prescribing them? And they're not. Um, so that's definitely something that's really infuriating for me. Um, and then what was your other question? Um, you know, how, you know, like how you saw it become part of your substance abuse path, I guess, right. or how that, right. became, where you're being treated for a, a mental disorder, but then you're, it kind of moves a little, I don't know. Right. Yeah. Um, I definitely think, I think it's just the intensity of the drug. Um, I know for me, when I would take Adderall in that high of a dose, it would just, you know, and it was such a thrill. It was like, okay, I can actually focus. I can actually go do this. I'm, I'm capable. I can work. That was the mentality behind this substance because I hadn't had that before. Um, and I think what touching on what Avani was saying, I, I was experiencing a lot of trauma in my house. Um, there were a lot of things going on when I was growing up that I was definitely bringing into the classroom. And I, I wasn't even aware of that. Um, I didn't become aware of that until, I was in college when I started dealing with everything that was going on. So um, taking Adderall and then having that influence the way that I viewed myself when I started losing weight because of the side effects or, um, you know, constantly having to regulate that high energy, being up here all the time and not wanting to be that spaz that's that now can do get straight A's, but is up here. So then I would smoke weed with my friends to come back down. It's like, um, I actually remember, cause I'm an open book as you can kind of tell. Um, <laughs> so when I was in my doctor's appointment, my doctor goes, okay, do you, do you drink? Yes. Do you, do you do drugs? Do you smoke? And I said, yes. How often? Um, and I said, well, I take my Adderall during the day and then I smoke at night. And he goes, it sounds like you're a junkie to me, but then continued to prescribe me. Wow. So, yeah. And it was, it's crazy looking back on that. Cause in the moment I was like, he doesn't know about, you know, I, I need my weed. I need my Adderall. That's my thing. That's how I, I can do well. That's how I can be social. That's how I exist. Um, but when I look back on that now and see how much that combination escalated, um, yeah, it's really disturbing to look back at that one conversation, but and it's exactly that it escalates, you know, you're constantly chasing that high, whether it's okay, now I want to try Coke. What's that like? Um, I want to try Xanax because weed isn't calming me down enough. And then I self-medicate with benzos. I I'm taking cocaine all the time. And, and then I'm just in this party scene. And again, it's a, it's a combination of the two and I'm, I'm aware of that. So, wow. but yeah, that's Thank you for sharing that. I like to hear it from you know, other people's perspective. Wow. Whew. Yeah. There's some I, I just, Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Ivani. I, I just want to also say, this is not fair to put this on parents, right? Or to put that on young people, because here are parents who hear, oh, my child has ADD, or oh, my child has depression. You know, we should have more mental health awareness. And then what, uh, you know, are they supposed to know that Adderall has a very similar chemical structure to methamphetamine. I think if they would know that, they might not want an eight-year-old child to be put on this medication, um, but they're not informed about that, you know? So it's just, you know, and then people say, well, we need more mental health awareness, but, you know, I'm not sure, like I work in a high school that probably has more mental health services than any other high school in Boulder, and our teens, our students are not getting better. They're getting worse. Uh, they now can tell you a whole list of, you know, psychiatric diagnoses that they have received and how much uh, different medications they're on. Are they doing better? I don't think so. So I think we are in a really challenging time uh, where we need profound changes uh, for our young people and people all ages to get better. 
I'm going to read a comment for some from someone. He said, our edu education system is a factory model not well suited to how the human brain actually learns. There is nothing wrong with you or your brain, Holly. Isn't that sweet? <laughs> Thank you for saying that. Um, I want to shift to another good question. This is probably Libby. Uh, I suspect a lot of medication is prescribed out of fear that clients will die by suicide if they don't aren't they if they're not prescribed something the film is wonderful and yet i have conflicting feelings about that suicide risk what are your thoughts on this uh <clears throat> i think the risk is higher when you're on meds um i i think that there is uh, given your your movie and what people are experiencing i mean you never had thoughts of suicide when you weren't on meds and then you have them when you're on meds and this is the same thing I see with addictive drugs. And this is the same thing I'm seeing now with the marijuana, especially the higher potency marijuana. Um, people that have never had thoughts of suicide, all of a sudden are having thoughts of suicide. And I think we're starting to understand it better in terms of brain chemistry. We're still not there yet completely. But one of the best things that's come out of our legalization of marijuana is a better understanding of the endocannabinoid system in the brain. And I think that it interacts very well with all of the other systems in the brain because the endocannabinoid system is the homeostatic system. And so it helps to balance the serotonin, the norepinephrine, and the dopamine. And when you start messing with that, that system, which is our normal system, then you start having um, dysregulation. And, and so I think that, you know, especially the drugs that are potentially addictive, like the uh, stimulants, the benzos, they um, really can affect your frontal lobe in a big way. And so it can cause your endocannabinoid system to be dysregulated, which makes you having problems with your mood stabilization. And then it takes off your frontal lobe, which is your executive functioning system. So you feel horrible, and your brain goes, well, I got a solution. Let's just kill myself. And that's, I think it seems to come out of the blue, but I think it really is uh, something that's happening to our homeostatic system. And, and so that's why I think the risk is higher on medications. And that's why when you prescribe a medication, you should see people very regularly. You can't just give somebody a pill and they say, come back in six months. But that's what we're doing with marijuana. People get a medical card and they see that doctor once a year and, and people are then using that. So um, this, is, this is, you know, something that you have to be careful with. I also, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I also, I also wanna say, you know, the fact when people get diagnosed and put on medications, it really affects people's identity in terms of, oh, there's something broken in me. There's something wrong with me. You know, I was hired by a school here in Boulder to do brain spotting trauma treatment with the students that have not gotten better with mental health services. And the students just fall out of the sky. Like I explain trauma to them and the symptoms of trauma and that there's actually nothing wrong with them, that they actually reacted in the right way and you should see the shift in identity you know so i don't think we're serving people by not helping them understand what is actually going on in their brain and what depression is and what anxiety is and that they're all part of our biology and yes there might be times you need help but it doesn't mean that you were born with a mental illness that then you're going to have to live with for the rest of your life so i think you know empowering people with education how trauma is different than a mental health disorder I think would be a really good step of getting people out of dark places yeah yeah and kind of going off of that it's it's what it's kind of like what Angie said in the film because when you get put on the psychiatric meds okay, here's the Adderall, here's the antidepressant, whatever it may be, you still, once you come off of it, you still have to deal with all the stuff that you originally started with. You know, <laughs> I didn't magically learn how to make myself get good grades in school. I'm still navigating that. And Angie, you touched on that. You still had to grieve um, 
your friend after passing 13 years later. And it, it, the medication it may make it seem like in the moment it is helping, which I think is kind of speaking to the short term thing, but eventually you do have to work with that. And it just is kind of a matter of when. Um, Good point. Yeah, on the topic of informed consent, I just want to share, especially with suicidal thoughts, I invite everyone in the audience to just go online, go to Google, put in any generic antidepressant. I don't care what it is. It could be Celexa, Prozac, Cymbalta, pick one, it doesn't matter. And just read the label, read the 35 pages on the FDA label. It clearly shows withdrawal symptoms. It clearly shows a black box warning for suicide. And the trouble is, is when you present, because this is lived experience, three times this happened. I had a switch in drugs. You know, one time my Lyrica was doubled because of chronic pain. Um, and next thing I know, I'm suicidal and I'm sitting in the garage with the, with the windows closed and like some kind of hypnotic state, not even realizing like, Angie, your car is running and you're in the garage. Like, what are you doing? It was horrif horrifyingly scary because I didn't want to I, I did, it's like, I didn't even know what I was doing, you know, but then when you present and you say, I'm having these suicidal thoughts, or this is happening and it's really scaring me. And I don't know why I'm doing this. That is seen as another mental illness. It's not seen as that's a possible side effect. We need to taper you off of that. Now, my doctor did recognize that in the Lyrica because it was very clear. Like I doubled the dose a week later, I'm sitting in the garage, you know, but that's the trouble with, um, informed lack of informed consent is that we get a little pamphlet from Walgreens and trust me, I've done it myself. You throw it away. You don't even read it. The doctor that you're seeing doesn't have time to read that. We have got to start reading that and believing it. It's not like that. That is what got the drug approved. You know, that is it's evidence. It's not even Adderall. When I read the Adderall label just for fun, I know I'm, I'm weird. I was shocked. It, it said you can experience psychosis or altered states of consciousness at a low therapeutic dose at any time. That's literally what it says. But then if a kid experiences <laughs> psychosis and they go to their psychiatrist, what do you think is going to happen? That's a schizophrenic diagnosis that follows that kid for the rest of his life. So these things are real. They're not antidotes at a certain point. You know, a lot of people say like, this is antidote. Okay. Well, I could show you hundred thousand patients online right now that are having these troubles. To me, that is enough antidote. Maybe nobody's getting paid to research us, but there's tons of case studies. You can go read their history. It's, it's there. Ugh, I'm just passionate about informed consent. Like we have to, part of this is us, that we are trusting someone else with our health, with our mental health, with our bodies, when we might not know so much that we think we know. Teresa, you popped right on. You wanna ask a question? Go for it. Um, no, I, I just wanted to make a comment that it's interesting that when I was growing up, you know, a lot of people didn't talk about their feelings and mental health was kind of hush hush. And then now we're in the day and age where we all talk about it. And now the answer is just give someone a pill when in the old days, you know, therapy was talk therapy. So, you know, I, I can remember going through after one of my kids was born, some postpartum depression and getting um, a prescription for Prozac right when it came out. And I felt great immediately. And I went back to the doctor and I said, this is, this is pretty amazing. Like it, it immediately, you know, I feel better. And he said, yeah, this, these drugs are gonna take over. We're not gonna need to have talk therapy anymore in wow. the future. And I just thought, <laughs> well, is that really what I want? And so I ended up, you know, going off it and now, um, one of my children has a, a drug problem. And I think it's a deeper societal problem, like what Avani said. We want, a, we want a quick fix for everything. And we've been convinced that there's a magic pill. And that sitting with our feelings is not what we do anymore. We don't have time for that. But that's what we all need, I think. Mm -hmm. We just need to talk and we need to have someone to listen. But... And I'm also, I agree with Jason. I, I'm, I'm against a lot of these 30-day um, treatment centers. It's all, it seems to me, it's all about the money, what they want to get people in there and they, they're giving them more drugs and getting them addicted to different things. So I don't know, that's just a, a side thought there. Thank you for sharing, Teresa. Thank You're you. welcome. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see, where do we want to go next? Anybody else have a question? You want to pop on and ask by yourself or talk about yeah go ahead victoria um i just wanted to make a comment that 
you know, I recognize something and I think a lot of it just comes with, you know, my education and being able to be a part of this, you know, what we're doing now. Um, and then also just being in my fifties, whereas before I was in my twenties and I didn't realize I just had that blind trust. And so I had years of being on Prozac for just depression from trauma and I felt nothing, nothing for years. Well, and then later I get off of them, go to college and here I am now, you know, and I had been put on Adderall a couple of years back because of the fact that, you know, I went and got diagnosed with it. They did the the stuff and I was like, oh, okay, you know, tried me on a couple of different ones. I'm like, take me off of this. I'm seeing things. So they <laughs> got put on Adderall and it's like, all right. And then they tried to get it higher. And I was like, oh my God. So I stopped it. And I was like, no, just leave me at that level. So they did. Right. And so now I'm having medical problems and everything go to, I've been in and out of the ER with serious medical things that have been happening. And then down in the ER told you're having a mini stroke. And I knew that I was because I lived it. I can feel it. I seen my body, you know, and then get upstairs and they're telling me, no, you didn't. I said, the doctors downstairs said I did. And I lived it. And then they said, well, if you did, no harm came to your brain. Then I was readmitted within a month again. And I had a blood clot just before that mini stroke. And that was in the jugular vein. And then had admitted again a month later after the mini stroke. And they thought that there was a blood clot in my brain and were readmitting me again. And then got yelled at again by these doctors in the hospital and said, you know what? Everything came back negative. Um, your blood, everything came back negative. You're fine, you know. And the neurologist did a full workup. And I said, really? They never drew my blood because I still haven't had a, a wristband. They refused to do it. I said, until I get an armband. And then secondly, um, I never seen the neurologist. And then they were like, oh. I would, you know, I was mad. And then they said, well, we are going to recommend that you see a psychiatrist because it's somatic and you be put on something. I was livid. And I said, you know what? I think this is the appropriate response for what is happening to me. And I'm not getting any answers and I'm not getting better. And so, I mean, I have been in and out of specialists, but I was really kind of appalled and don't like the experience, but I can tell you what, it's really shifted the way that I talk and address people. I really, I thought I met clients where they were. Now I really do because I'm like, I hear you. Let's address what you want to address. And if you don't want to, that is fine. I can, I could not believe what I've been through and what I've been told, you know? And when they don't have answers, a quick shove with pills. I actually thought I was having seizures. The side effects were seizures to meclosine. I was um, put on uh, a, another benzo to help my muscles relax. And then the Adderall, I got off of all of them. And right now I'm just taking Tylenol and the Eliquis and I have so many symptoms, but I'm glad for that because I can feel them. I almost feel like they wanted to medicate any kind of feeling or, or response I was having. I'm like, I feel that the responses are something you need to address because medical needs to be ruled out first before you even try to go there. And I, I just, I couldn't, I, I, I was appalled. Really appalled. Thank you for sharing that, Victoria. Yeah. There's a lot of questions. I'm going to say, uh, I'll probably answer five questions at once really quick, and then I'll pass to Avani. But the people are asking about, are there any support groups or centers in Boulder that offer help to people to wean off psychiatric drugs? Another question was about uh, the evidence base for the film. All of this can be found on our website. We have all the research that was presented in the film. We had to do that with lawyers to make sure like what we're saying is not lies. So everything is research-based, and all the research is on our website. There's also um, withdrawal and tapering resources, like how to educate yourself about tapering so that you can be your own best advocate. One of the lessons I've had to learn is like, there's still that I need an expert to help me. We chase, we're like chasing these experts or like a detox center. You know, I see it a lot that people want to go somewhere and be taken off. And it's just not the way the system is ran right now. So it's like, it's almost opposite. Like you have to become the expert in your own body and your own tapering strategy and advocate with your doctor. If you can even have one <laughs> that will help you. So I want to say that. And then, um, 
finding prescribers. So can you talk a little bit about like natural highs? Like how is that an alternative? And then Libby, maybe talk about like tapering and being your own best advocate and how to talk to your doctor. Yeah, so I mean, we what we offer in natural highs, uh, both to teens and adults is really neuroscience education, right? So we teach a lot about the brain, uh, what anxiety is. We, we have an initiative called How to Turn Anxiety into Your Superpower to actually, for people to understand what anxiety is, that it's a reaction in the Stone Age design brain and not necessarily a mental health disorder. So we teach a lot of tools and skills, and we also offer resources like AccuDetox that really can help people just work with their own um, brain and sensitivities and symptoms, uh, but we're not a medical program, right? So we are not uh, helping people uh, get off psychiatric meds or anything like that, because that's out of our uh, area of uh, what we what we do. But we certainly educate people, and a lot of people get a lot of benefit and empowerment from that. Um, so yeah, so you find our resources on naturalhighs.org. Uh, we run groups for teens right now in person outdoors, and we run classes for adults. Uh, so you find all of that information on naturalhighs.org. And I want to pass it on to Libby for the medical aspect of that question. Okay, I, I think I strongly encourage you to advocate for yourself with your prescriber whether it's a physician, nurse practitioner. Um, and I think you can be insistent that you want to be safely taken off the meds. And if they don't know how to do it, then encourage them to find someone to help them. And I have offered to be a consultant to the prescribers. I can't treat people. Um, I've actually retired from clinical practice, so I can't see people myself, but I'm very happy to talk to the prescribers to help walk them through it. And it's, and it's very different for everybody. And some people, like I have used, I noticed in the chat, there were a lot of people talking about um, supplements, micronutrients. I have actually used micronutrients to help people get off of psychiatric meds. Uh, and so I use mostly a company called Hardy's Nutritionals. It's in Canada. And they actually have a really good um, working group that if you're interested in going that route, they will work with you online. They'll talk to you, they'll talk you through it, they'll talk your doctor through it. Um, but it's a very slow cross taper from going from psychiatric meds to micronutrients, which are basically high potency vitamin mineral supplements. So there's, there's alternatives for a lot of people but like that, that Hardy's group, I've heard them talk to people because a lot of people are on capsules, you know, and there's just a zillion little tiny balls in a capsule. And so some people actually take the capsule apart and count out the balls and you're doing just a little bit at a time, just like on the movie, you know, cutting up the, the uh, Xanax or the Ativan, I guess. And um, sometimes you have to do it that way. You have to do it really, really slow. Yeah, let's see. I don't know. I think that's pretty that we've gotten pretty much we've either answered a question or came in around in a roundabout kind of way. But is anybody that's on camera left that wants to maybe share? We maybe have room for like two more. Does anybody want to share? Can I just ask um really quick why the generic um means that we can't sue the manufacturer anymore? Because I really want to sue them. <laughs> it's like it's the fact that it's off patent, so it's basically okay. like selling off. It's like when a drug is patented, they make all the profits off the name drug when it's brand new, and so that's kind of why you see like Vyvanse is like everywhere. You know, it's marketed everywhere because they're on patent. But then when they come off, it's like you're selling off. I don't know a used car or something. I don't know how to explain it. But then when it's off patent, it's generic there's really nobody to sue because the original manufacturer doesn't have responsibility for it anymore. And so it's sold off to other companies. I don't know. It's complex. My best yeah. advice is on the medicating normals, um, Facebook page. I'm going to interview a lawyer named Michael Baum, who is like, he wins cases. 
from pharmaceuticals and he was going to talk a lot about um the evidence base for antidepressants for teens and we're going to do that like the last week of april so mm -hmm. i would recommend you come to that event if you can it's free and just ask that question and i'll try to bring it to him or if i'll if i remember i will but he will explain <laughs> that i'm not a lawyer but it's kind of complicated but... no i get it i that was that was very helpful i think i get it so thank you Anthony. yeah if anybody wants more of this, uh, I did an interview with Angie on our podcast called This Badass Sober Life. And it's a very beautiful conversation. People have already told us that it moved them so much. So I put the um, the link in the chat. I don't know if you found it. Hold oh, on. I got it right here. I got it. I can post it again. So if you didn't get enough to not, oh, sorry. If you, shoot. Uh, if you didn't get enough um of of today's conversation if you want more that's where you have you know 45 minutes more in terms of the background of the film and angie's story and what we do in natural highs and all of that so the link here on youtube that's the interview that i did with angie thank you and then i will definitely uh I want that we do more showings in collaboration with Angie and Medicating Normal. So uh, if you want to know when the film is going to be shown again, uh, please sign up for our emails on naturalheist.org and then you will get the invite when we do it again. Same goes for us. Let's do it again. Let's do it again. I this like is it. really important information. I, I want to I want to sue the drug companies. I want to sue <laughs> Nixon for Let's change the world. Come on, John. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, I think we should talk about that topic. Let's talk about this last topic because it's a really important one. There's somebody in the chat talking about their son experiencing extreme extreme states of consciousness. Um, there's someone else that's having um, like problems tapering, and I. I keep, I just have this nagging need to talk about kind of what Holly was saying, that we don't change the education system, we blame the kids. And that's a really important point that we're not learning how to regulate our own selves. I know when I was first put on meds, what happened was I had all this trauma in a very short period of time. I was on an airplane leaving Baghdad, Iraq, believe it or not, landing in Germany, asking if I wanted to go for a beer that night. Okay. Within like eight hours, I'm in a war zone almost you know being shot at almost dead to like walking the streets of germany and that messes with you you know what i'm saying we have these jolting shocking experiences and we don't have the capacity or people in our lives to help us like move through that so i love the idea of getting like emotional training in schools i do not like the idea of you know scanning for trauma because then it just becomes another diagnosis and a route to medication when these kids are two or four or six or eight and they're having you know these not the great not the greatest home lives with parents working and all this stuff so can we talk about like the way i see it hold on let me just say this the way i see it from a social work perspective is that we have all these societal problems but instead of fixing them we can blame the individual for instance, this blew my mind. If you raise the minimum wage like two or three dollars in a city, the suicide rate goes down. It's not a mental health problem. These people are broke. <laughs> exactly. no? But so, so like, just like Holly said so beautifully, I took a, a class in social work school. It was an eight hour lab on Saturdays. It was two, two weeks of eight hour classes. I couldn't even sit there. There's no way. And I'm like, we expect kids to sit there. Of course that we're going to, so I don't know. Can we, what do you all think? Even if you just are in the audience and you want to pop on and just say a comment about it's the individual's problem, not the society or not the way we do things or not the pandemic causing anxiety. If you don't have anxiety right now, like I'm worried about you. <laughs> I, actually, I, I am scared shitless. I'm in my RV. Like, don't come near me. Stay away. You know? <laughs> like, what does people think about that? Like in the audience, what do you think about? Is it your problem that you're mentally ill or is it a society that we live in that is just, we're not on the right path, politically, socially, economically? I yeah. think it's all of it. And it's historically where we are and culturally where we are. And it's our place and time in history that creates how we have to deal with life and how we have to navigate it. Yeah. I'm 77. Uh, years old and I've been taught all my life since I can remember not to big boys don't cry don't mm -hmm. shut your 
your feelings. So all of this stuff feeds right into that for, for men anyway. And I think increasingly for women too, you know, your feelings are irrelevant. You've got a, you've got a problem, you know, suck it up. <laughs> exactly. We are yeah. really pathologizing individuals' reactions to collective problems. And in my experience, having worked as a substance abuse counselor for the, over the last 20 years, what I see is that the people who carry symptoms are more sensitive to the yeah. disconnect, yeah. you know? And it's not fair that we then put more sensitive people through more shit, right? That's not okay. I mean, that to me in the film, you know, what was put on people that are sensitive is not okay with me. And we need to change that. And we need to work together on that. Uh, educating people that if you have anxiety, just like Angie, like you just said, if you have anxiety right now, you are a sensitive, caring, intelligent human being. And when we say that to kids or to people from marginalized backgrounds, their jaw drops. They're like, you mean I'm okay? I'm like, yes, you are actually more caring, more sensitive, more intelligent. And your anxiety is the proof of that. I mean, you can see people are just like, what? Everything mm -hmm. changes, right? And we, we owe it to people who are sensitive that they deserve this education. And you all now have to be ambassadors on that, okay? With being here, that's now your part of your job. You need to spread that knowledge that, you know, there's, there's nothing wrong with you. Yeah. Yeah, it's like the peasants rising up against the, the king. I mean, look at that whole money sign uh, following of the, you know, how they create that corrupt system of, you know, the, the trials, not, you know, and just that whole system uh, backing it up. And it's just so wrong. And it's us few people that have this awokeness. Um, and it's, it's going to take a uh, a lot of people and a lot of effort to overcome that, but I believe we can. I want to I want to I wanna say something about the um, the psilocybin question that was asked. Uh, stay very very awake, okay? When you see studies on ketamine and psilocybin and everything else that can be sold, stay awake. And ask yourself, why are we not seeing studies on acudetox? Why are we not seeing studies on brain spotting, on things that don't make money? Okay. I just, that's all I want to say to that. Because stay awake. Do not let them feed you more bullshit. That's all I want to say to that. And I, I would like to reiterate the fact that what Avani said, <clears throat> these people and maybe many of you are really very normal in terms of you're more sensitive. And that's really why I have really liked working in the addiction field, because I find the people that are in recovery are like the healthiest people in the world. And I, um, they've really found themselves and they, they were, you know, kind of self-medicating because of all that sensitivity and they had learned from society that, you know, you just take something, whether it's an addictive drug or alcohol or a pill, and then you're going to be better. And they have figured that out that, well, no, I'm not better, I'm worse. <laughs> and so they've actually gotten to the point where now they're in recovery. And um, all that sensitivity is still there. All that creativity is still there. And it's much more accessible. And so that's why I love working in this field and I love to see people seeing, rec you know, recovered. And I actually do believe it's a, a re totally recoverable illness. I, I don't call it um, a disease. And I don't say it's like inevitable that you're going to relapse. Like, I hate it when people say, oh, well, it's just a relapsing disease. I, I don't think that's the case. And I think there are many people that have fully recovered but it takes a lot of support. It takes a, a community for sure. People have connections with people. 
And that's why I love what, you know, like what Abani is doing with kids is teaching kids early on that you have natural ways of feeling good. You don't have to resort to these chemical ways. And, and that's why I love the Acu Detox because it's basically you're learning that you have your own innate capacity to heal. And so it's basically acupuncture is allowing you to heal from the inside out. And that's, those are to, so awesome things, but yes, there's no money behind them. Nobody's ever going to get rich from um, trying to push Acu Detox for sure. Or brain spotting. <laughs> Neurofeedback. <laughs> John wanted to shout that out. Yep. Yeah. So I think let's leave it there. Um, this is just a heartwarming conversation. I actually feel a connection with you, even though we were on Zoom. It might not be the whole <laughs> way, but I did feel like we were all there in a moment together. So I appreciate you all being here and being present. Um, I'll just say a few things. Well, let's let you all have final thoughts really quick. Ivani, John. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much for being here, for presenting this, for telling these truths. Um, I'll, I, it, it set me on a bit of a new path, personally. That's great. Ivani, where can we find out more about Natural Highs and all your wonderful programs that I love and I attend myself? <laughs> I mean, I just want to say thank you to every person who came on today. You know, you are radical. You are courageous. You are going against the stream of what is fed to you uh, to believe. And that takes a lot of courage. That doesn't feel comfortable. So I have so much respect for every single person who came on today. And I really hope that you carry this forward and that you talk to everybody about these things. And uh, anybody is welcome to be part of our community. You can sign up on naturalhighs.org. Uh, and get our emails, our invites, our activities, so that you can see if there's anything that you want to be part of. And last, uh, if you want to find out about more screenings, to share it with your friends or your colleagues or your family members, just go to medicatingnormal.com. We also have a YouTube channel. This conversation will go there um, later. Um, we have like over 30 panels. You can hear from all different experts all over the world. We have interviews once a week on our Facebook live. I tweet articles and, uh, on Facebook, all, you know, from the pro informed consent angle, um, from the patient empowerment, from being a leader the, in your language, Ivani. So if you want to read, learn more, we have a reading list on our website with all the books and the people from the film. Anyway, there's information galore. And what I always like to say is don't believe anything we say. Just go start your own journey. Everything we said, don't believe us. Go look yourself. <laughs> let, let this be the beginning. All right. Thank you all so much. Have a good night. Thank Bye. you, everybody. It was great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Bye. Take care. Bye, guys.